I'm here today with Professor Alexander Field of Santa Clara University, who is also the Executive Director of the Economic History Association. We're here to discuss his new book, A Great Leap Forward, The 1930s Depression and U.S. Economic Growth. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So we had a great leap forward at a time when everybody thought we were in a ditch. Right. Describe what you mean by that notion. Well, I think most of our scholarly attention, understandably, has been focused on the output gap and the unemployment that characterized the, the Great Depression. And kind of disguised or lost by that is the fact that there was actually a, a tremendous increase in uh, potential output and actual output, almost all of which was due to productivity increase. And I kind of became aware of this when looking at some of the numbers and, and uh, realizing that hours, total hours in the private non-farm economy grew not at all between 1929 and 1941. The, un the labor force was larger, but the unemployment rate was still a bit higher in 1941. Uh, and by some measures, the capital stock was, physical capital stock of the private sector was about the same. And yet output is somewhere between 33 and 40 percent higher, depending on how you measure it using chain index methods or whatever. And that's all, essentially, all of the growth in output and all of the growth in labor productivity is coming from total factor productivity growth, improvements in efficiency uh, and uh, innovation. And so the, the, the real, the hook, if you like, of the book is to contrast this narrative, which I th was what I think has become conventional, which is the idea that the war, the Second World War, somehow magically transformed the, the doom and gloom of the Depression into a situation in which the U.S. is standing astride the world economy like a colossus in 1948. And you talk in the book about uh, essentially what you might call the composition of these productivity gains. Right. And there are really three major That's things. That's right. One is a continuing high growth of total factor productivity uh, growth within manufacturing. Not as high as during the 1920s when you had a one-time historically unique transition involving the internal distribution of power away from the shafts and belts of the 19th century to electric wiring, small uh, electric, small horsepower, uh, fractional horsepower motors. Uh, but nevertheless, a rate of TFP of growth which we would kill for today, over about 2.7 percent a year. And my view is that that's largely being driven by the effects uh, the, by, of a uh, privately funded, the maturing, uh, privately funded uh, uh, R&D system, uh, which began with Thomas Edison in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Enormous increases in R&D employment and spending, particularly in the second half of the 1930s, a real surprise. But lots of exciting things happen. So was it largely? Uh how you say this private R&D system, big companies that had fr free cash flow didn't require the banking system to yes, nourish I, their Yes, I think budgets, that's or? fair. To, you know, we talk about how important small companies are for innovation. And of course, there's lots of stuff going on on the ground in terms of mundane improvements and in instrumentation and insulation. But these are, these are big companies that are doing it. So that's, that's essentially one of the tributaries. Now, the second one uh, involves essentially the, the, uh, the idea that uh, well-chosen public infrastructure spending can make a, make a big difference. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, car and truck production had vastly outrun the capabilities of the surface road infrastructure. We produced uh, over four million passenger vehicles in 29. We didn't get there again until 1949. But you know, there was actually a very broad political co coalition in favor of better roads. The farmers wanted, they were complaining that the French farmers could carry their grain for half the price per ton mile. And we were, we were paying a quote mud tax. and the you know, the asphalt makers wanted it, the bicyclists wanted it, the car makers wanted it, the motel industry wanted it, the petro petroleum industry wanted it, actually the railroads wanted it too. So they had to work out where it would be located because location could make or break a community. And they had to bring together the, all of the state highway departments and, you know, agree on where this would happen. Even though there was a broad political coalition, that doesn't make things happen right away. So that, if you like, treaty uh, is, is, is finalized in November of 1926, and they publish a large map of the United States showing where all of these routes, you know, in California, US 101 or 99, which runs down the state, you can still see those on the, on the map. And then they start building. And if they built, first of all, in the late 20s, you know, saying that this was going, what we would say today, a supply side rationale, you know, expand productive capacity. You know, as soon as uh, the economy went into recession, they say, okay, this is make work. You know, it's kind of Keynesian rationale. But aside yep. from 33, 34, and 35, where you do see some dip, 
you look at the data on street and highway construction from 26 to 41 and you'd hardly know there was a recession. So they build and they build and they build and by 1941 the system is complete. They stop building during the war because obviously they need to devote resources to other factors. But that had huge benefits in terms of the private sector, in terms of spillovers, particularly to trucking, but actually also to railroads in terms of a symbiotic relationship between them and then indirectly for wholesale and retail distribution. So I would say those spillovers are about equal in magnitude to the contribution that's coming out of manufacturing. Uh, again, the rate has fallen since the 20s, but the sector's grown a little bit. Okay, so the third tributary is what I call, the, if you like, the kick in the rear of adversity. I think the poster child for this third tributary is probably the railroad system. And because of that and other innovations with electrification, the beginnings of shifting to diesel electric locomotives, which have many, many advantages over steam locomotives, you see the rail system being able to carry a little bit more freight and almost as many passengers in 1941 as it did in 1929, even though employment, you know, number of people employed, number of locomotives, number of freight cars, these have all dropped by, passenger cars, these have all dropped by uh, roughly a third. Mm -hmm. So what's fascinating is you have a public investment in the road system and you actually have private sector politics endorsing that public spending because they can all see how that's going to enhance their demand right. for their particular sector. Exactly. And they formed a, a critical mass or coalition. Right. Uh, you see everybody dealing with adversity and trying to become more efficient and inducing cooperative behavior. Uh, was the war actually an impetus to that as well, that during the war people couldn't afford to be parochial and in inefficient because there was a a national yeah. cause? Yeah. Did, did, did that well, my, my, I mean, I think certainly productivity advance continued through the war, but it continued at a slower rate overall. So I see the war actually as somewhat retardative. And again, a couple of facts you have to keep in mind about the war. We were, you know, in the Second World War for less than four years, full, full, which is, you know, a lot less, lot less time than we've been in Iraq, for example. There's no question that the massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, you know, closed the output gap very rapidly. So that's absolutely clear, and I'm not, disp I'm not disputing that. But the the, the, the expansion of output that closed the output was, was, was very unbalanced and very you know, different from what you would have had in a normal expansion because you have a quintupling of some sectors. So I, I view that as actually somewhat disruptive of the progress of consumer-oriented, uh, uh, consumer-aided R&D. You've also got lots of factory managers and, and, and executives who have to spend a lot of time dealing with government procurement regulations. And uh, that, those are some of the reasons why I, I kind of have a somewhat more jaundiced view of the long-term benefits of the Second World War in terms of our growth and economic capacity.